All right, so Paul, if, if we see places like the moon, where if you go into the shadows in the nighttime, we, we plummet in temperature, if I stand in the shade here on Earth, I'm not going to freeze instantaneously, so why? It's colder than sunshine. <laughs> but, um, and of course, the benefit is we have an atmosphere. Yep. Okay. So here, what I've done is I've simulated a building and we're having sunlight falling on the ground on one side of the building. Okay, so it's on this side, on the, on the lighter side, and then yep. the, the other side in the shadow. Now, if this is on the moon, this side would get really, really hot, and the other side would be absolutely frigidly cold. But on Earth, you've got this atmosphere around it. So what's going to happen is, as this side gets hot, the heat's going to be conducted into the air around it. Okay. And that air, as it gets hotter, is going to become less dense, because when you heat things up, they become less dense, hot yep. air rises. And it will start rising up and swirling around, and that will carry some of the heat round to the other side. Oh, OK. So it's actually the atmosphere that's now doing the work of transporting this heat to the shadowy side. That's right. So on Earth, you don't get the big temperature range, firstly, because the, the atmosphere can carry heat from the sunny side to the shady side. Okay. Also, because your heat going in is not just going into heating the thin layer of the building, a lot of the heat's going into the atmosphere. You've got a lot more things to heat up. Yep. I mean, on the moon, especially if you've got something like dust, when the sun comes it up, it can heat up a very thin layer of the dust. The heat doesn't penetrate very far down, so it might be the top centimetre gets you know, 120 degrees, and then below that, the heat doesn't penetrate. Okay. Whereas here, if you want to heat the Earth, Earth up, it's not enough to heat up one centimetre of thickness. You've got to heat up all the atmosphere above it. Okay. There's more to be heated, more what we call thermal mass. Okay. Uh, let's look at the whole planet now. So here okay. I've got a planet, and the yellow planet, and I've given it heat around the equator. Yep. The idea being the sunlight's coming straight down on the equator, whereas the poles I've made cold. And the, the red's the, coming into, uh, and the, red's the atmosphere? The red's the atmosphere. So here's what's going to happen. And what, of course, is going to happen is the air is going to rise at the hot bits near the equator. Yep. And as it rises up, it's then it's going to have to go somewhere. And it's going to start sinking in the cold bits in the pole. Yep. And so you're going to get a, a, a convection cell, if you like, where the air okay. rises, flows away, and then cools down again. Okay. And this is why, let's say, the hottest temperature ever recorded in the equator, equatorial regions of the Earth is in 56 degrees. Yep. And the coldest temperature ever recorded is like minus 88 in the high domes of Antarctica. And that's a big range. Yep. But it's nothing like the range you get on the moon or Mercury or something that's, like that. That's, that's and right. And that's because the heat from the equator is transported by the atmosphere to the poles. Whereas on the moon, because essentially it has no atmosphere, there's nothing to transport that heat to the poles. That's right. Uh, now, this is what you'd get if you had a planet that was hot in the middle uh, equator, cold at the poles, but wasn't spinning. Okay. But of course, planets are actually spinning. That's right. Um, so here's what actually happens on the Earth. The air does indeed rise near the equator. Yep. Um, and then it tries to flow, um, flow out. Um, but because the Earth is spinning, as it flows, uh, it, it's diverted sideways by the Coriolis force, uh, the rotation. Yes. So what you actually get, instead of one cell where the air rises at the equator and goes all the way to the poles, you actually get multiple cells. These are yeah. called the Hadley cells. Yep. And they drive the trade winds and the general winds on the Earth. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, time lapse taken from a, uh, uh, weather, weather satellites. This is put together by uh, UMETS, the European Meteorological Satellite Organization. Yep. And what you can see is you have bands at different regions of the Earth yep. with the wind going in different direction. Yeah, and, and it, you clearly see there's more clouds and less clouds at some of these bands. Yeah, so right at the equator you've got the air rising and that generates yep. lots of thunderstorms. Yep. Uh, then it flows out and then at about plus or minus 25 or 30 degrees the air is sinking. Yep. And that gives desert belts because sinking air doesn't tend to produce rain. So you get a belt of deserts about that latitude off both sides. And that's what we see on Earth, right? We see deserts kind of that mid-northern latitude and mid-southern latitude. And then you get another band in the temperate zones with again a desert and then lots of rain up around uh, Areas like Europe, where yep. England, where I come from, where it rains a lot, <laughs> and then and so on. And you see, the winds tend to blow in systematic directions. You get one direction at one place, another direction, another place. So this is all because the heat is coming mostly at the equator, but it's spinning, so it's being churned up. Yes, yeah, so you're getting the air moving out and then being spun sideways, and then sinking, and then more cells going okay. out. Now that's the Earth. If you want to get real weather, though, what you'd need to do is spin the planet faster. Okay. Because that means instead of getting three cells, you might end up with like 20 or 30 cells. Where the wind can't get as far before being spun sideways by the rotation. Are there any planets that do this? Well, funny you should mention that. Uh, there is, of course, Jupiter, which spins like every 10 hours rather than every 24 hours. So it's spinning much faster. It's also much bigger. 
and it's got yeah. really thick gas. On Earth, the wind is slowed down because it's brushing across the ground. Yeah. But they don't have to worry about that on Jupiter. It's just brushing against more gas further down. So it's not only spinning faster, it has more atmosphere, more of these layers. So do we see more of this convection and turning on Jupiter? Yes, yeah, so what you can see is it's got a lot of bands. Yep. And the Earth's basically got three bands. The Hadley cells, whereas on Jupiter you've got, I mean, count how many bands you've got yeah, here, lots yeah. of these things. And you can distinctly see them spinning. Yeah, and they're going in different directions and different speeds. You've got the giant red spot as a storm. Yep. So this is exactly what you expect. In fact, if you take a climate model for the Earth, the same things they use for weather forecasting, and say, let's make it much bigger, let's make it spin faster, uh, and you, you get exactly this coming out. So, so really, the weather on Jupiter is essentially the same as the weather on Earth, just bigger and faster. Yes, it's just driven by the same thing, heat at the equator, cold at the poles, because mm. in the equator you've got the sunlight coming in the poles, you're radiating heat out, air tries to flow from one to the other, it's diverted sideways by the rotation, and that gives you all these beautiful weather bands on Jupiter. So then if you were to change the speed or the different layers, you would get different patterns depending on what your planet is doing. That's right.